to uh, Kata itself has always, from its inception, tried to create a very broad uh, and inclusive understanding of what Asian American in the 21st century might mean and give folks an opportunity to self-identify into this kind of coalition building, network building uh, organization, which really started as a, as a, as a movement and became an organization. Um, so we're here to partly talk about why are we here, why are we together, and how do we have this conversation. Um, so um, I also want to acknowledge that Heather Rafa just flew in this morning from New York because concurrent to this Kata convening has been uh, a mixed fest in New York fo focusing on Middle Eastern artists. And uh, it's like um, sad and wonderful that these conversations are happening in two locations at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so it's really wonderful to have Heather here to kind of bridge the conversations in two locations uh, and fill us in on, on what's been happening. So I'll tell you a little bit about this, the, the structure of this. The panelists are gonna introduce themselves uh, in a moment briefly, and then we generated a whole bunch of questions among ourselves, more than we could probably get to in the amount of time that we have of things that we think are, are like, juicy and we want to talk about together. And we're going to just make a space where you get to listen to us having this conversation and flowing between some prompts and questions. And then at the, at the last 20 minutes or so, we'll open it up to take uh, questions and comments. And m I, I encourage us to not so much a Q&A, but really have a community dialogue. Um, but we're going to ask you to listen for a little bit first. <coughs> so with that, I'm going to pass to one of our co-hosts for the Kata Conference, Jamil and so from Silk Road Rising to start off introductions. And very briefly, hand
panelists, I'm going to ask you to say who you are, where you're located, what your discipline is, how you identify, if you wish, and uh, what else did we say? Yeah, I think that's pretty good. <laughs> Jamil, you want to kick it off? Absolutely. Please say thank you to Jamil for being a co -host. So Jamil Corey, also a proud board member of Kata. Yes. Uh, founding artistic director of Silk Road Rising, co-founded with my husband, Malik Kalani, right here. Uh, I am a, uh, a producer, a playwright, and an essayist. I, um, I identify as mixed blood Arab American or um, mixed blood Arab and Slavic American, and we can throw queer into that equation. Uh, uh, he and his. Uh, and uh, based in Chicago, and we are entering our 16th uh, season as, as a company, um, and really excited about all the intersections that we're seeing playing out this week here at ConFest, and, and looking to build on that. Gazarian. I'm the founding artistic director of Golden Square Productions in San Francisco. We're the first American theater company focused on the Middle East. I'm uh, Iranian, Armenian, uh, she, her, hers. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Heather Rothwell. Um, I was born in Michigan and have lived in Brooklyn a bit longer than my time in Michigan. I'm an Iraqi father and an American mother. I'm a playwright and an actress and most often a mentor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm Fuad K. Moore. I'm an Egyptian-American playwright. I also sometimes will call myself Arab-American, Muslim-American, whatever, Middle Eastern. Um, mostly a playwright. I have done some uh, other things. Um, I've recently acted in a play by Jamil Corey, which will be screened in uh, January. Um, my work has been, uh, I've, I've been affiliated with Chicago Dramatists, uh, produced at Pretty Cat Productions, had works at Silk Road, and also actively involved in the International Voices Project. Uh, which does work <coughs> in translation, uh, festival, a yearly festival. I'm involved with the Arabic language programming. I've done some translation and direction for that. Um, anything else? Yeah, and did you say how you identify culturally? Culturally, yes. <coughs> oh, okay. uh, also, Fuad just flew in from Egypt. Yes. So, oh. yeah, oh. you might get to like, like, travel <laughs> the farthest <laughs> today. <laughs> <laughs> Um, also, I didn't do my other part of the introduction, so um, I identify as Arab American and I am um, Lebanese American on my father's side, third generation, and white European American on my mother's side. Um, I use she, her, or they, or non-gendered pronouns, and I'm also queer identified, and I live in Tampa, Florida. I'm the founding artistic director of Art to Action, Inc., which is based in Tampa and New York. Um, so, I'm going to begin, and the, we're not, we're not going to go in any particular order, because I really do want to be in conversation, um, with this question of why are we here at Kata? Um, what is it, like how do we locate our various identities within a more broadly inclusive Asian American framework or, uh, or conversation? 
conversation in the 21st century. And, and, then, and what are the benefits of being in that coalitional, mm. broadly identified conversation as well as, you know, kind of when do we need to be specific about uh, who, who we are in those specific things that our, our fam sometimes families or communities or, uh, or theaters or, or, or artists are struggling with. So, um, so I'm just gonna open that, I, and I'm, I'm gonna merge one and two for the sake of time and say, and just acknowledge that like the Latinx community, the Middle Eastern American community um, is, it is, is vastly diverse in how we present racially, right? So some of us are very white casting, some of, some of us are very dark skinned, some of us are readable as Middle Eastern, some of us are not. And, um, and so that creates this really, and, his, and legally and historically, we have been categorized, legally categorized as white, but that's not the lived experience that many of us have in the United States. So, uh, so the question is kind of, you know, how do we navigate <coughs> these things around identity and how we identify ourselves and what it means to be queer at the National Asian American Theater uh, Conference and Festival? Does anyone want to jump in with that? Jamil? Uh, sure. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Jamil Khoury. Uh, I will introduce myself as Jamil Khoury, and people will hear Jimmy O'Khoury. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have an ounce of Irish blood in me, <laughs> uh, but nevertheless. Uh, so, I, I struggle with this question. I, I like to think I'm politically a person of color. Experientially, it's complicated because of how I look. Yeah. And absolutely, I am the, the, the beneficiary of a great deal of, of white privilege, uh, of white male privilege, and you know assumptions that people make about me on the street and, and so forth, um, you know, don't tell my story. So I have a really hard time relating to any number of categories, um, and I, I, I'm forever negotiating that. Yeah, I, I get the same problem when I introduce myself, and now I try to introduce myself slowly, because when I say, hi, I'm Kuwate Moore, people tell me, how are you doing, Kuwate? They assume my last name is Moore. Oh. Yeah, and, uh, and I'm thinking of starting a hashtag, I'm not a white male. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't feel like it. Anyone else want to? I'll jump in. I mean, more than anything, my personal experience is that of an immigrant um, and one that is, uh, I don't know if misunderstood is the right word, but it's, uh, there, there are many surprises in the US. You know, when you come here as a teenager and you've sort of grown up in, in one country that's, um, I don't know, you sort of identify one way and then you come here and then people put labels on you and you have to sort of make, figure out why that is. And uh, some of it is historically, um, I don't know, there are some historical reasons, political reasons. Uh, but for me, it was really difficult. And in the beginning, I used to make fun of the whole, um, the, you know, the, the census categories. Because, you know, Caucasian, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so, for those of you who know, Armenia is on the Caucasus Mountains. So if anybody is Caucasian, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I would say, well, I am, uh, so I must be Caucasian, but then, you know, Caucasian is perceived in a certain way. And the more I um, uh, was integrated into the American society, I then was treated in a certain way, and there were many assumptions about, once people learned that I was born in Iran, there were many assumptions about Iranian women, many assumptions about my religious practices. Uh, I grew up Muslim and Christian, and you know I don't have a problem with either religion. Um, and you know, there are just all these assumptions, kind of, you carry them as a burden in a way, and that burden, uh, becomes heavier and heavier as you become older and you interact with more people in more in multiple fields. 
Um, and once I, by the time I started working in theater, this sort of politics of representation and identity were at the core of my work because, um, because I wasn't seeing you know, my stories on stage and I wasn't seeing representations of, of the kind of woman I am and the kind of family that I grew up in. And so that it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing daily struggle, I would say, to, to um, um, I don't know, reduce one's identity to a checkbox. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a disservice, I would say, to all of us. I understand it has administrative mm -hmm. and political uses, but mm -hmm. you know, thank you. Yeah, I'll say that I said something that's on my mind lately is that our we have a very unique experience being American dealing with this, but I think the Middle East is very much dealing with it as well. Mm -hmm. um, my my perspective is hugely influenced by war. Being Iraqi American, I can't get away from that part of my upbringing because at 20, there was the first war and then there was the second war and there was 13 years of sanctions in between and how many years of occupation. So it's like my relationship to being Middle Eastern is hugely influenced by constantly having to bridge two cultures for the sake of kind of keeping them alive. <laughs> and together and talking to each other and not seeing each other as enemy. Um, so that, that, I can't get away from that when I think about identity and polarizing my identity or saying, what am I? Because it's been, you know, since birth, I've been navigating two parents of two very different places and then communicating that to anyone else in my community. Um, but I also, I'm also in pursuit of this because Iraq itself was arguably one of the first melting pots, as many of these cultures are. I mean, it was a place where so many people came through and, and, and many Iraqis will, will say that they felt quite one with their nationality and their brethren and sistren, and now it's in quite a crisis. So things, the way we're being pulled and torn here is something that I'm seeing happening to a country where people will say they don't even feel Iraqi anymore. And I think it's, it's just an interesting way that our conversation here in America is reflecting in, um, in the Middle East in general. And that takes me to another thing that's been on my mind is because internally to our community as we talk about majority religions and minority religions and color of skin and all these different country of origin and the, the different ways that plays out. Um, I feel that, I'll get back to that. I, I feel like I'm taking it down a different road, but I, I anyway, okay, I'll go. Is that, I, I think that it, and on the one hand it feels like we're talking identity so much and it's pulling us apart in a, not in a bad way, in a discussion way. And then I keep thinking, gosh, the Middle East is in the middle. I know it's a problematic term, Middle East, but it's still in the middle. So maybe, maybe our community is actually one of those bridge communities in and of itself. And the way we start to create work with our African neighbors and our Asian neighbors and our European neighbors might really be something at the crux of the dialogue itself. So that, that's my, my latest bee in my bonnet is, oh, isn't it kind of cool that some of us do pass and that some of us can navigate three different communities? Absolutely, <laughs> right? Because maybe we're, the, maybe we're gonna be a bridge builder in how we create the art that is going to cross dialogue. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my experience of identity resonates with and echoes everyone else's, what everyone's saying here. Um, the idea of name, uh, how your name is read. Uh, every time someone hears my name or sees my name, they'll be parsing it as that question, where are you from? 
Um, I don't know how many times I've answered this question, how many times, how many different ways I've had this conversation. Uh, where are you from? When I, uh, my husband and I were first dating 12 years ago, he's a white American, and I said, watch, this person coming up to us is going to hear my name, yeah. and here's how this conversation is going to go. They're going to say, what, what's your name? How do you spell that? What is it? Where are you from? And I'm going to say, I'm from Texas. Because <laughs> I know what they're asking. I don't want to get this So I'm going to say, I'm from Texas. Um, and where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and so it just, and then finally, I, you know, my parents are from Iran. And it's just that um, that uh, expectation, that demand, uh, that you have to tell your story <laughs> at all times. And, and with that is that it, it, that assumption that you are not from here, you are not of us, mm-hmm. even though I'm as American, as, I'm more American than Iranian in so many ways. Um, but. You know, it is, it's more complicated than that as well. And, and, and part of it is also skin color and the way that Middle Eastern people and Middle Eastern descent can be read as various things. And, you know, if it's summer and I'm a little darker, I'm gonna read a different way than if it's Chicago winter <laughs> and I'm lighter. Um, and then part of that also and related to those two things is how other people define you and whether those other people are individuals or the state or documents like the census. Um, you know, or early in my life, I would check white because I was told Middle Eastern is white, even though I felt the violence of being erased in that way. Um, and then I would check other, and other just didn't seem like it fit either. And I just wish there was like an ish box. <laughs> but, uh, um, it's it's interesting. It's complicated, and uh, it's you know this is how I negotiated and navigated in my personal life. But then that also informs the art and the writing. Uh, that's always the question is do, with every play, do I represent Iranian Americans? What, what other ethnicities do I represent? Um, is there that expectation that I have to write Iranian characters because I'm Iranian American? Even though I've never been to Iran, I don't speak Farsi. Uh, so anyway, we can go down that path as well if you'd like. Um, I want to also offer my perspective on this. Um, I identify as a person of color. Um, my, uh, I was raised by my, the white side of my family because my father and mother split up very young, but my, my father was quite noticeably darker than, than I am. <coughs> and uh, in, 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 in some way, my, whatever, whatever people think Arab looking is, my sister is more Arab looking than I am. So I'm often read as Latino or, uh, you know, all kinds of things. But, um, I find, I, I, I recently found, I want to share this because I find it a fascinating history, how did Middle Easterners come to be categorized as white on the census? There was actually a legal, I, I had to do research for this for an anti-racism training recently, and there was an actual legal battle that went all the way to the Supreme Court um, that was a, a, man, a Syrian man who wanted, who arrived to the U.S. during segregation and wanted to be categorized as white. (laughs) And you can understand the stakes of that, right, in that particular Mm -hmm. historical moment. And in that, at that time, these categories, you know, the categories are renamed and changed like throughout US history in these really, really disturbing ways. And at that time, uh, the category was Asiatic or Mongoloid. That was the actual category, right? And, and so this guy won this case. This blows my mind. This guy won this case at the Supreme Court by saying, if I am a mongoloid, so was Jesus, because I come from the same land. <laughs> the Supreme Court freaked out and were like, oh my gosh, we can't call Jesus a mongoloid. <laughs> to the board of Kata, the way that I think about it is also that, of like recognizing that this is an extremely American conversation, right, around race and identity and category. And this whole notion 
of Asian American is actually a, a construct, a political construct, mm -hmm. in response to US imperialism and military intervention in Asia, right? So the experience that we are living <laughs> is the formation of an identity in response to American imperialism and military intervention in West and Central Asia, right? So for me, that is the reason, if we acknowledge that all of this is constructed anyway, that is the reason for us to be in the room together. Uh, that's, that's my personal view. Um, I yeah. wanted to add something. So I told them to do the audience surveys. I have demographic questions. We've been doing it, it's the same survey that you guys do. We've been doing it for five years, and <clears throat> we knew from the beginning that this question of do people self-identify as Middle Eastern is a big question, because we wanted to sort of track mm -hmm. how people's feelings towards that umbrella identity is uh, changes over time, because in a way, Middle Eastern American is a, is a term that we began using, and I don't know that it necessarily existed um, in, in sort of representation conversations before that. So, so we wanted to see if people self-identify as Middle Eastern, and then we knew that many may not, and we wanted to see what the breakdown of identity is. So we listed uh, all the countries that we consider uh, to, in, to be included in, in the umbrella, uh, including Armenia, Afghanistan, you know, uh, Egypt, Libya, It's a long list of like, I don't know, 25 countries. We included languages, what languages other than English do you speak at home, mm -hmm. and religion. You know, do you identify as any of these religions? Yeah. Muslim, and we mainly included the uh, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, and Zoroastrian. Um, and, and what's interesting is that now looking at five years of data that of the people who don't self-identify as Middle Eastern, uh, many of them, about I think it's actually about 12 or 18 percent of them, identify with one of the specific countries that we consider to be mm -hmm. uh, in the Middle East. And, uh, and many of them uh, may not uh, identify with a country or self-identify as Middle Eastern, but they speak the language at home. So these sort of personal ways that we each connect with our identity is very complicated and I don't, yeah, you know, it's just really interesting to and track it over time and track it from production to production. So depending on who's in the, in the audience, it's a really interesting study. I, I, I want to say something about the legal battles that were fought like 100 plus years ago. Uh, today, this is taking a somewhat different uh, tone with regards to the 2020 census. Now, there had been such a strong push to include a MENA category mm -hmm. uh, in the census, and that was really seen as a victory on the part of, of activists from, from within our communities. Uh, my understanding is that under the current administration, it's being taken off the census. It will not appear mm -hmm. um, as a category in 2020. However, a lot of people are now saying, we don't want to check that category under the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, does this become tied to a national security discourse of, of some sort? So it's really, you know, once again, shifting, um, you know, the contours of, of that conversation. Who we are legally. So, and, and, you know, and the stakes of that on the one hand are about how do we have political power if we're not counted? And on the other hand, what happens if we're counted? under a regressive government. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, nobody brought up the issue of representation in our work and what stories we get to write or tell. And it, it's interesting that there, there is this kind of thing like by virtue of being a quote unquote Middle Eastern, almost all of us are culturally or ethnically or racially mixed actually. In fact, <laughs> like, you know, if you look at Lebanon, it's like centuries of conquest after conquest after conquest. Uh, what it is to be Lebanese is not at all clear in any kind of racial DNA kind of way, right? Um, so, but, and yet we are, it, it, on American stages, faced with these questions of representation that I think we've kind of been talking about throughout the week in various ways uh, here at CASA, and that there are some things that are specific 
that we have to deal with. So I don't know if anyone wants to say anything further on that or roll into the next question or what you feel is important to say about what is important about representation in a particular work or um, producing it. Yeah. I, I think we should recognize the voice um, because we're represented by different categories of voices. Some of us are American born, ethnically connected. Some of us are expats. And, and there's also the other category of theater and translation, which, which I love because it brings a perspective that is pure from the Middle East into theaters in, in the US, but it has to be categorized as such because that, that should not override our voice here because we, we bring a different perspective. The, especially the expat category, uh, the problem is that when, when I go and talk back in Egypt, people tell me, you don't have the right to criticize because you don't live here anymore, mm -hmm. right? And I tell them, no, I, I actually, I'm, I'm following everything and I want things to be good here so I can speak. But, and, then, and then when I speak here, well, you're not fully American, you're, mm -hmm. you're uh, naturalized. So, so that, that category of the expat voice is the one that I, I would like to see expand a little more and and reach audiences. Mm -hmm. Because we have something to say. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's such a, a large and tricky landmine of a question and topic of representation and ethnicity and identity. Um, I mean, as Heather said, we, we are so focused on identity. Uh, so much it seems at this cultural moment and it's I've lived long enough where I can see these moments come and go mm -hmm. and it does seem that it's partly because we're living in a regressive reactive government that also is focusing so much on de identity and I understand the progressive response which I also share is then to also focus on identity but a different way from a different angle with different values but still focus on identity and um, for me, that's not usually the starting point as a writer uh, when I'm thinking about plays. I'm not, I'm not discounting that it is for many people. I'm not discounting the values of that. I'm just saying it's not universal and it isn't for me. I don't start by saying as an Iranian American playwright, what kind of Iranian American play am I going to write? Um, it's more what, which I think a lot of writers work this way, what interests me? You know, having to learn to pay attention to what grabs your attention what grabs your imagination, pleases your imagination, that process that every writer does, which may or may not include identity and ethnicity, or may include it in various ways that aren't a simple one-to-one, -one, I'm a Middle Eastern playwright, so I write Middle Easternly, whatever that may be. <laughs> um, but you know, it also means that when I do write, as I have plays that don't feature named ethnicities, uh, that conversation we were just having about seeing, still being perceived through that lens, viewed through that lens, still applies to the work. Mm -hmm. um, so I wrote a play recently that was given a stage reading um, where ethnicity was not at play. Um, you know, there was a casting note who was cast diversely, but that was it. And the main actor, the main character had a, a kind of different sounding name, but the, um, the producers assumed because of me and my name and my background that I wanted that person to cast, be cast in that way, in that kind of mean a way. And I really didn't. It, it, and it, you know, when once I explained that to him, he was totally on board and fine with it. It was a, a lovely staged reading. But just that assumption that you, and a, a director of that same reading said to me, see if people re see your name and they are always going to assume mm -hmm. that you are writing that way, even when you're not. Because mm -hmm. it's kind of, you know, just how it is. <laughs> but looking at it from a, like an artistic producer, an artistic director perspective, you know, I think it's very common, we, we see it in, in, in our playwrights, in our community, that people feel a burden of representation. Mm -hmm. People feel the, the responsibility, I must tell the story of my people, mm -hmm. and I must share like the full history of, you know, 4,000 years of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Egyptian history or Phoenician history or, you know, and so I think that is very alive in, in our community. But more and more at Golden Thread, what we encourage people to do is to write, you know, the story that it feels urgent and real to them. And, and 
go at it from a very personal, you know, artistic, like follow their personal artistic path and and more often than not, the end result has elements of their culture in it, you know? And that I think is organic and is, um, is true to them, but I think this idea of, um, especially because of what's going on politically, I think we all feel like we must correct, you know, the, the zeitgeist out there and, and, um, and it's, it's a heavy burden. You know, I encourage playwrights in our community to, to sort of tune that out when they can. And that corrective, you know, sort of interventionist yeah. impulse. I mean, it comes from such a defensive place, uh, tragically. I have this very distinct memory of being uh, 12 years old, so I think it was 1977, uh, and, and reflecting, thinking to myself that I am associated with, with two categories, two communities. Um, uh, Arab and gay, uh, who everyone hates. Like, <laughs> no one around me in any context had anything good to say about either, uh, either of those identities. So I, I did have this, this very keen sense that we have to somehow correct that through narrative, through stories. I'm, I, I probably didn't use that language in my head, but that was the sense. And so it was that reaction to something very sad, very tragic. Yeah, and the need to then explain the whole history. I remember that we have a, a few years ago, we produced a play that was about two women um, caught in the middle of the Iran-Iraq war. And in their dialogue, there was all this exposition sort of explaining the history and the border and the geography. And I'm like, this, you don't really need this. And she would say, you know, the playwright would say, but people don't know. Who, where these countries are, or what their relationship is, or when the war happened, or how it was, and you know, we had, we took a lot of it out because the story stood stood for itself and we didn't didn't need all of that. That, that pedagogical instinct. Yeah, the, the teaching and the. Yeah. And, and I agree with with all that is being said. That exactly what Ali says. We we don't start out planning to do this. You mm -hmm. do what you're interested in, and you're doing. But um, at the end, it's the voice that, that comes through. And our voices are colored by our own experiences. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I can write a story about nothing that has ethnic correction, but when, when you read it, there are these hints of something mm -hmm. that are always in there. I didn't say that. I, I'm also uh, an engineering, a chemical engineer, a chemical engineering professor. So everything I write has a little bit of some shade of science or engineering in it, mm -hmm. because that's what I know based on my experiences. And, and, and the more we allow ourselves to be comfortable and act naturally, the more this will come out, that the, the voice of that community that is not heard. I'm gonna give Heather a chance to respond to this yes. question if you wish, and then, uh, and then I'm gonna throw this into another one. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, if you all want, we can continue that piece. But I wanna get to this, um, so we posed questions to each other by email prior to getting together, and some of us just met today for the first time. Um, and this one really uh, everyone wanted to address. That, um, how is a Central or West Asian or Middle Eastern or MENA, to use your term, how, how is a theater, our theater movement revolutionary, given the title of this? How does our work both challenge our own communities and mainstream audiences? And I just wanna say, as we dive into this, I just wanna remind us that for our community, revolution is not a metaphor. Mm -hmm. We have very, very transnational communities. Some of us have families that are living through war or revolution as we mm -hmm. speak. And it's important to think about what does revolutionary mean in a U.S. context, mm -hmm. and also please note it's not a, it's not a metaphor mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, so what so what does that mean for us to build a cultural movement, a theater movement um, together? Anybody want to address that? I think Heather. <laughs> God. I mean, I had a hundred family members in Iraq 
start of the second war and I now have two. Mm -hmm. So the refugee crisis is real. <laughs> They're scattered all around the globe. Some are waiting to get places, some are stuck in different countries, you know? And so it, it's, you're right, Andrea, everything feels revolutionary. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I wrote Nine Parts of Desire, it was the first Iraqi female protagonist in the English language. Mm -hmm. And so I think every act our community does is pretty much revolutionary. I think any one of us writing and getting up on stage in these critical times is revolutionary. It just, it just is, and it continues to be over and over again. Um, these are dialogues that are, you know, have to be had, and and we're perfectly placed to have them. We have the the history, you know, to allow us to bridge these conversations. So, yeah, I think I think it, it's also a, it's also a fairly new community, as in the last couple decades, right? I mean, as a as a gathering force theater community, it's. It's, it's fairly new, and I think that that's also really exciting. Um, I think the thing I'm thinking about most is the multiplicity of our voices and how that can have a bigger impact on the American theater. So Taraj and Jamil naturally do this because their whole season can show an audience how diverse the voices are. Outside of theaters like theirs, there's maybe one slot for a Middle Eastern artist every five seasons. Mm -hmm. Maybe at best, <laughs> right? So, and then the pressure on that one play, that one playwright, that director, whatever, to be like, we have spoken to this national, if not global, <laughs> right, crisis that's going on. And then, you know, it, this is maybe harking back to the last question, but how many of our plays get picked up or don't get picked up based on what we're writing about, mm -hmm. right? So I think that um, I'm really thinking about how there can be how there can be more things side by side, so that everybody's involved in a broader conversation, and not just pigeonholed into whatever conversation one artistic director thinks might be valid. Mm -hmm. I, I want to speak to a particular revolutionary act. So. Uh, at Silk Road, we showcase playwrights of East Asian, South Asian, and Middle Eastern, West Asian uh, backgrounds. I, we've often said we've made a special commitment to Muslim voices uh, and to combating Islamophobia uh, through storytelling and in a very humanized, so not Muslim angels or Muslim demons, but Muslim human beings. And, uh, and I'm not saying this in a self congratulatory way about our company, but it is the act that I am probably most proud of because it's the act that we get the most pushback for. Uh, so I, I just want to put that out there. And, and also there were many years when we could not get funded for anything that had the word Muslim in it. That was sort of the, wow. yeah, so like the, the, the kiss of death. No one wanted to touch for any number of reasons, you know, there was just too much fear, too much anxiety, too much, you know, concern. Uh, so, so I, th and I think naming because all, most of us probably come from uh, a somewhat secular place, and I, I, it's been very important for us to specifically name Muslim experiences within this repertoire. So the Patriot Act actually forced foundations to make sure the whatever money they're giving is mm -hmm. not going to, you know, Muslim organizations or, or which Arts are, included. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, which are, yeah. Where we're assumed to be supporting, you know, arts and religion. Um, yes, actually, there, and, and some of our, grant, I mean, this is important, Noonie, uh, um, some grant contracts, for example, have a clause that say you cannot use the money to support any artist who 
calls for the end of the state, mm. which is code for mm. let's not talk about Palestine. Mm. Right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we have we have to as producers and presenters and fundraisers, we have to navigate this stuff. I want to sort of go at the question from a different angle. So when we uh, started Golden Thread Productions, you know, there was a lot of questions about, <clears throat> is this gonna be an Iranian company? Is this going to be Iranian Arab company? Like, how are we gonna define our mission and who is our community? And, um, and you know, so we, about three years, we had those, those conversations. And we sort of landed on Middle Eastern American theater, mainly inspired by Asian American and Latino American American theater experience. I mean, without those histories and mm -hmm. all that had been accomplished by those communities, we probably would not, I probably would not have gone in the direction that I did and, and, and sort of the, the mission, the way it was defined by Golden Thread would have been, you know, possibly very different. Um, but this idea that the, despite and maybe because of the multiplicity of experiences and voices that are in our broad community, that we are stronger because of that. We are stronger when Arabs and Iranians and North Africans and Armenians and Turks and Kurds come together and, and sort of build a coalition that doesn't take away our individual voices, but says together we are, we are more powerful and we are louder and we can take more space. And I think that is a credit to Asian American theater that in many ways also includes nations that were at war together, uh, <coughs> that had invaded each other, yet the communities here in the US come together and collaborate in a way that they probably can't do in the home country, which is also the case in, in, in the Middle East. That Golden Thread, we bring, you know, <coughs> individual, artists from communities that are that have historic animosity or currently are at war and nowhere other than the US I would say they can actually come together so it's it's an incredible opportunity we have to do a, a kind of collaboration that is not possible elsewhere and, and when we think of Turks and Kurds and Armenians and Arabs Persians Assyrians Berbers we're, we're told we're not supposed to like each other uh, either for historical reasons, political, you know, uh, and that has been so, I would say, successfully rejected and refuted within, uh, within the Middle Eastern, uh, the MENA theater community, and, and I think that's hugely exciting. Uh, and, and the experience of uh, watching Turkish American artists watch a play about the Armenian genocide, which their government tells them did not happen, uh, and them agreeing and acknowledging and feeling and expressing empathy uh, is, you know, it's, it was it's very powerful, it's revolutionary. Yeah, absolutely. Following up on what Jamil was talking about, about um, you know, Islamophobia and um, responding to things, sometimes playwrights will naturally veer towards one of the two extremes. Angels and demons that he was talking about. Either be very defensive and say, no, no, everything is great and, and whatever, or, you know, no, we're really horrible and, and we, we're showing it up here and that's what you want to see. But what is really rev revolutionary is to actually come to the center and, and have a capacity at self-reform, mm -hmm. at showing that, you know, these are human beings, they have the same experiences, exactly the same experiences as everybody else in here, and we're not afraid of talking about things mm -hmm. and, and, and pointing them out. Uh, especially in the Muslim discourse, there is always a fear of, of talking about any specific topics because of backlash and stuff. No, this is how it is, it should be. But everything should be open for discussion. We should be able to go after things and, and talk about them. And, and just to give a quick example, I, I address the issue of polygamy uh, in, in one of my plays. And, and maybe people say, well, is that very important? It is because of, of how it affects the lives of people. And when you put it on stage, you say, here, discuss and see if, if, if there is something that can come out of that without being 
attacking my own community, but with like, let's put things out there and discuss them. That's how things get revolutionized. Mm -hmm. I want to say that in my own work, I've experienced um, like that, that thing about we're not supposed, we're told we're not supposed mm -hmm. to like each other. Um, by being, being queer identified and as a Lebanese American, I was raised Catholic, not Muslim. And, um, and, and I was very much taught that I should somehow be afraid. Of, like there's this, you know, Muslims and queer people aren't supposed to like each other. So, and, but I have experienced more fierce solidarity and support from Muslim women than like anybody, <laughs> right? In, in terms of like having the courage to have these inter-community conversations and uh, what does it mean to stand for each other? And what does it mean for me as a queer, Catholic raised, Arab American to fight Islamophobia? Because it affects all of our community because anti-Arab or anti-Middle uh, Eastern prejudice and racism is intimately bound with Islamophobia in the United States, right? So we're all affected by the way that these multiple forms of oppression work. And, uh, and, and what is revolutionary is when communities really work together. Did you want to say something? Okay. Um, so this, this can continue. We're moving toward like opening it up pretty soon, but I think um, but right before we do that, I want to um, say that we had this other um, question we wanted to tackle. It's kind of two questions that I'll roll into one around um, how you know how can we how can we do better at reflecting and supporting the diversity within our communities and, and building solidarities in the intracultural work and then also in the um, across identity. Um, you know how can um, Middle Eastern American artists more fully be a part of this broader Asian American movement or movements happening by theaters of color and artists of color who are working on, uh, on, on coalition building. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna put that question to the panel and then from there we're gonna just have a dialogue. Yeah, anybody wanna say anything about that? Well, I mean, I don't have the answer, but my thought is that with this, this like laudable goal of building coalitions in our world and other worlds that we live in, I think a lot of that is being um, able to, having the artistic license to not just write our own stories. I think that there is a real impetus now to um, feel like we have to tell versions of our own stories. It gets back to this focus on identity that we were talking about. And then several people this week have said that it's kind of, it, in some ways that's part of the theatrical enterprise, but it's one small part of the theatrical enterprise, which is really about creating empathy with people not like us. And being able to feel like you can't tell someone else's story because they're not like you, and then how do you define people not like you? Is that identity? Is that gender? Is that you know, if I can only write gay Iranian men, then that's a very limited <laughs> theatrical oeuvre. Monologue. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's my concern with this, the, this kind of focus now on the authenticity of our experiences, which is not to dismiss. It's also not the totality of our experiences, and certainly not the art totality of our artistic imaginations. And I, and I just say that because it's, it's Allowing for that, I think, then builds towards this greater cohesion that I think we all want. I'll jump in, and this is a conversation Andrea and I have had, but it, I'm, I'm, I'm really in pursuit of something that's not empathy and is value-oriented. Because mm -hmm. I feel like I've, I, f I feel like the last two decades of my theater work were so concentrated on empathy and did a really good job at it, right? <laughs> like, like I, I mean, I, I got somewhere with it, we've all got somewhere with it, it is super duper, like, <laughs> yes, but, <laughs> right, super duper. But then, but then some, it's not enough, it's not quite right. Mm -hmm. So that sense of we're all telling our own stories, right? We're all, t 
telling our own community stories, challenging our own communities and others, and creating empathy, like profound empathy for people finally understanding people from the Middle East or feeling they're humanized. It's just, it's still, it's just not enough. It's just, you can't. Well, enough. Like, I mean, I think value is very different than empathy. Back to this idea of like, Yes, one Middle Eastern slot every five years, but also that's in competition with the one Asian slot, right. with the one Latin slot, with the one, you know, and then we're all in competition, like, not that we're in competition with each other right now, I'm just saying that ish, right? Like it's not, we have, it, it's, in getting a really empathetic play, an empathetic story, we get to feel sorry for those people and then they're those people. <laughs> and they stay over there as those people. And I'm like, no, value is what you want. I'll write a play about whatever the F I want to write the play about, and they're going to put it on stage, because it's a good play. <laughs> and it's next to the other good play, and we're in the same season together, and we're pushing up against each, back to the multiplicity of voices like within the Middle Eastern community, wouldn't it be, you know, when those dialogues start happening, well, then it's way better if we're in dialogue and our plays are pushing up against each other in the same season. Mm -hmm. And we're naturally crossing over audiences going, aha, yeah, right, you know, then it's, then it's value. Mm -hmm. And other people are just watching the good plays for the value of the stories, not the representation mm -hmm. of that play from that community that had to say the hard thing of that tragedy that's going on in the world right now. <laughs> I just feel like my brain's exploding with the empathy thing. Uh, you know, only for having pursued it for so long and knowing it's good. No, I'm not naked. It's so, it is so needed. It is what theater does great. But I'm, I'm just, I'm in pursuit of something and I don't, I don't have an answer. <laughs> One of the things that uh, Jamil and I have been talking about and I think in our community in San Francisco Bay Area we talk about a lot is sort of centering our narratives enough uh, defining ourselves in relation to some perceived white center, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So yes. adapting mm -hmm. plays from each other's communities, uh, writing characters from each other's communities in our plays, uh, not assuming when ethnicity is not defined, when ethnicity is not, ethnicity of a character is not specified in a play, let's not assume that goes to a white actor. Could be any, any kind of. So those are like practices that we are now, we've made like our practice at Golden Thread and we encourage uh, our playwrights to also explore. I mean, we've never in our, our mission is if you're a playwright of Middle Eastern descent, you can write about any topic. So we've never, maybe because I'm a playwright, I've never wanted to box myself into being forced to always write about my experience or my community. Um, so really encouraging our artists to, to um, whether it's through co-productions, which we've had a number of co-productions with Asian American theater, with African American Shakespeare, to really build concrete collaboration relationships with uh, other communities through the work relationships that's based on the artistic exploration. And that historically there always have been relationships between Asians and Africans, between Asians and Arabs, and this is, mm -hmm. you know, this is a pre-colonial, pre-European mm -hmm. period. And Iranians. And Iranians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to say, you know, it's a very small, short space, I mean, you, uh, between um, uh, empathy and pity. Uh, and I think as, as theater makers, uh, we are, all of us in this room are in a negotiation all the time with white liberalism. And white liberalism <laughs> loves its victims. Um, and, you know, so the facts, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> Please don't the, apologize. Yeah. The, the fact that, you know, we refuse also a victim status, mm -hmm. that this isn't about being downtrodden and miserable and so forth. Um, has also been a, a big challenge yeah. for you know what type of work people want to sanction. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Farad, did you want to offer anything, or should I just open it up? Just very quickly, there are a couple couple of things that I 
I like to hear is when, when an audience says, I've never seen anything like this before. Mm -hmm. Or uh, they say, well, I didn't know that about yeah. you. So I don't know if that's empathy or not, but it, uh, Naveed mentioned the word universality, and that, that's what we're all going for, is to mm -hmm. feel that, oh yeah, and that sounds exactly like my story in that community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, now we just want to open the floor to like, what's, what's percolating with you after hearing this conversation? And, um, and also, a question that I didn't ask that maybe is a question for the room is like, what feels, what feels urgent in our, the work before us? We're getting to the end of this conference. You know, what feels urgent as we move out from here? Oh, go ahead. Hi, sorry for to, I raised my hand too yep. early, but I'm <laughs> sure <laughs> inspired. Um, so uh, one, thank you all so much for doing this and, and taking space here and, and sharing it with us. Um, that in itself, you know, I, I assume is, is part of the change making. Um, uh, first off, uh, my name is Michael uh, Rosebrand and I am a theater student, uh, an undergrad at Boston University. Um, and uh, um, and uh, so I identify as Hapa. I, my mother is from Luzon. Uh, the archipelago of uh, Maui, which uh, through colonization has been deemed as the Philippines. Mm -hmm. um, and my father is a white European American. Um, and I just wanted to share that. So what I'm sort of like hearing and what is on my mind is that there's sort of this like juxtaposition, which was sort of started at the start of the conversation between like a desire for a label and terminology and nomenclature that fits ourselves because we like to or I like to proclaim a certain identity because culture matters so much to me and it's such an important part of my life that I like to be able to say something to someone to try and start to explain where I'm coming from, what my life has been about. But there's that's contrasted with like a longing for the labels to not define our lived experience because how can any one word, especially an English colonial word, explain my lived experience of being in this body for all these years and being in the world that we're in? Like how can anything really describe that or try to sum it up, right? Um, so in, in this conference we've been talking about like language revitalization, the importance of oral history in communicating stories and sort of that role and uh, that we play as theater makers. And one of my friends, um, from university who lives in Chicago, her name's Irion. She says, if you can say it, it's a word. <laughs> and I really like this because to me that gives us the opportunity and I'm sort of wondering if, if this interests any of you, like for us to start creating our own words because if we felt that America as it exists today hasn't, and English as it exists today hasn't provided us with the words we want to express how we're feeling how we are as human beings, like should we de be developing our own nomenclature um, to take back who we are from the people who have tried to label us? And like how can um, coining terms and, and making that uh, known through our art, through program notes, through whatever mediums we want, how can the creation of our own language and dialogue um, be used um, going forward. That to me, sort of responding to that question is kind of urgent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone want to respond to that? Mm -hmm. Well, I, just because it's, you know, I, like, in my gut, I hate the term Middle East. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that we say golden thread, Middle East center stage, like every time I see that, I'm like, it's, I'm stabbing myself. <laughs> <laughs> but, so having said that, uh, there's a very practical aspect to it, right? So back in the late 90s, uh, we didn't feel that we had the power or the voice to sort of fight that battle, the battle of language. We tested like, you know, <coughs> Near Eastern uh, or, you know, Middle East, North Africa, or SWANA is, a, is an acronym that's popular in the Bay Area, Southwest Asian, North African. <laughs> uh, so we, we tested a few of these, but people don't, didn't all recognize what you were referring to. Whereas when we said Middle Eastern, most people had 
a general understanding of what we were talking about. Even within that term, Golden Thread's definition of the Middle East is very broad and inclusive, which we always have to educate people on. But my hope is that we will continue to use that term until it becomes obsolete, and until brilliant minds have come up with a term that is both uh, realistic and uh, recognizable. And, and I would love to endorse that term when, it, when you come up with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, there's a couple responses and then we'll go jump in. So yeah. I'm hearing Michael telling us that you guys are saying we want to develop a cultural identity, but don't you dare label us. So, so it's, it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. and, and it reminds me of the conversation about affirmative action. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you discuss affirmative action, on one end, uh, yes, it's needed because it's correcting something that has been happening. But at the same time, it is a, um, an acknowledgement that there is a racial problem that has not been resolved. So it's never an easy debate. It's never an easy thing. And when we are in transition, that's what happens. So we need to be keep pushing and want our own identity, but at the same time resist people using it to uh, isolate us. And I just want to add, there were, in the first years of, of Silk Road, I tried really hard uh, with the term Southwest Asian, and I, I just kept repeating it to people, and they would respond, so you do theater from the Philippines and you do Thailand. <laughs> oh, I mean, no. that, that's what they would hear, and, and, and I was, well, well, yes, but not in the Southwest Asian context. <laughs> so I just sort of give up, you know? Yes. 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 Right, and the, the, the problem with all of this, of course, is it assumes like ancient Greece and Rome are the center um, uh, from which everything else is defined as West or East, right? And so if we're trying to and Africa isn't even on the map, so. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, really, that's where this language comes from. And then, you know, so I also want to lift up, like, another thing that connects us is is the 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 hit, colonial history and the and the responsive theory of Orientalism, right? Mm -hmm. Which was penned by Edward Said, who was a Palestinian, mm -hmm. right? And and so for in all that whole European colonial period, it was all the Orients, and it's a specific U.S. political agenda that has created Middle Eastern exceptionalism and created this term that we're all like, Ugh, but I gotta use it because nobody else knows, right? So I just wanted to acknowledge that. I, th I think these questions around language are really important because they carry these entire political histories. Um, so I saw Jonathan, and yeah, oh, ooh, now there's one. Okay, so these two first. <laughs> Oh, it's interesting what you said about the census. So like in the UK, um, the Arab community has finally got onto the census um, in the last time round, and uh, and so you know you, uh, because in the UK the census decides where resources are allocated with our local government. Uh, the Chinese went into Asian last time, and then our community centres, etc., etc., et shut because Asian is being uh, uh, in the UK taken on by South Asians, and if, if money goes to there, um, they will often it's not redistributed, you know, and Asian, as we know, where there was to be Southeast Asia. So I guess um, I, I'm wondering is, uh, is, is there similar mistakes that you have, you know, using these labels, uh, you know, can, can or cannot access funds? It sounds like it's uh, different. Um, and I guess the other thing is about, yeah, you know, I certainly relate to, you know, and I was taught to hate Japanese, and then I went to live in Japan for a while because my family from Hong Kong. Um, and, you know, and again, I used to uh, run Yellow Earth Theatre years ago, which was, again, mixing all these companies that would be, used to be at war with each other. Um, but I found moving forward, you know, finding, let's find different um, touch points. So I currently the group of artists producing on a, a, the first uh, Black and Asian Opera Festival in the UK. It's happening now, <laughs> as, as we speak. And we've got some Armenian, um, Nigerian, et cetera, et cetera. But it's our love of music that we talk about, mm -hmm. and you know those kind of things. I'm wondering if they're sort of like, it's a political identity, but do, surely is there a way to bring the art into the centre of this? So yeah, so mm -hmm. segmentation and bringing the art into it. I don't, really quick on that, I w music is so important because this kind of segmentation does doesn't happen in the music and literary fields. Mm -hmm. It happens in theatre because our bodies are racial. Right? When you start, when you're in the music field, it's very clear.
the relationship but between musical forms, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. just so apparent. It's not even a, it doesn't even need to be a discussion. Mm -hmm. and, and also in poetry, in the literary community, there's this much more easy uh, inclusion. And it's something about theater that has racialized all of us on American stages that makes these separations happen. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else wants to respond to that. Then we'll go to the next. Uh, I was just going to comment on the Middle East as an, an imperfect term, but uh, but a, a necessity and a bonding point to bring community together because of discrimination and um, <coughs> and the need for it to bring us into the room together and to have political face. Um, and I uh, so appreciated the comment about um, how uh, theater makers of ethnicity that um, we can bond with other communities of ethnicity and how important that is, that we, that we, don't, um, that we don't segment ourselves, but that we come together and to represent other uh, uh, other groups within our work as directors or playwrights or producers that um, because the, because uh, the United States has all of us in it let's put ourselves up on stage in all our richness okay but pull your hands up high so I can see you and we'll just go boom 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 <laughs> and we might keep up. So let's like, like keep it rolling. Yeah. Uh, just as a contextualizing thing, I offer, and I've said this in some other settings, that uh, when we look at um, the composition of the world, people of color are 80% of the global majority. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we know that things have changed already uh, in many cities in this country. So I offer, uh, there's a good friend of mine who keeps like pushing me to say, rather than person of color, people of the global majority. So. <laughs> <laughs> because I think there is a sense of solidarity, empowerment, and language matters. And it really shifts the game uh, and the centralizing of whiteness. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll identify myself. I'm Danny. I use he, him, his, and my background is Turkish, Sephardic, Ashkenazi, Eastern European, Jewish, and Cuban. Um, I've I've been thinking so much about how the the establishment of nation states is such a factor in the complexity of these individual and coalitional identities, and that we take that concept as such common sense, um, and. Uh, the, the way that you know a nation state both kind of smushes people together into a synthetic identity that maybe didn't exist before, and then also creates subdivisions that maybe didn't exist before. And you know, so my family coming from uh, Istanbul, part of my family, you know, it, I've always sort of um, I never identified as Turkish until I, I came to the Middle East and America convening at the Lark. And so I mentioned that I was Turkish Sephardic, and then all the Turks in the room were like, hey, and I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's like, well, my family wasn't from Turkey. There was no Turkey. It, we were from Istanbul in the context of the Ottoman Empire. And ethnicity functions very differently in that kind of an empire than it does in a nation state, which says everyone has to be Turkish now. And, you know, and when in fact people have, people, you know, Turks have, Kurdish and Armenian and all the different sorts of backgrounds that get flattened. And then, you know, um, and then that, you know, creates a lot of stress in my head based on these historical events that I wasn't even around for. Um, whereas conversely, like uh, the other example I think of is in, in Palestine and Israel, you can't, um, maybe this is changing a little now, but you, it doesn't make sense to people if you say Arab Jew, like it's a oxymoron. You know, and, and I've had conversations there with people where you, you have to say Mizrahi, which literally means mm -hmm. Eastern, um, and that's the term for the majority of Israelis who, are, uh, who have at least some Arab background. If you say Arab Jew, even though it's equivalent to saying Arab Christian or Arab Muslim, it doesn't even make any sense. Um, but pre-State of Israel, people identified as Arab, and Jews, Muslims, Christians, you know, whatever, there were 10 things. It wasn't this thing that like didn't exist. Suddenly, this this person isn't real anymore, and.
And so I'm just thinking about how, it, in not that necessarily there's a, there's a new language that will suddenly make sense after all this history of colonization, like you can't get rid of that, but in thinking about at least how do we conceptualize, even if it's complicated and still takes an hour to explain, like we need to go back and sort of look at the history of how constructs were imposed and even in our reactions to those constructs, how are we still bringing those concepts with us that, that don't actually make sense in, in our contemporary being, especially in diaspora. Um, anyway, yeah, so that's been on my mind, that, that reconstructing the, the history in that kind of detail has so much to do with how we think of ourselves moving forward. Thank you. I'm gonna take the, the people who had their hands up and then, and then come back to the panel, so just keep notes. <laughs> uh, who, who is this? Yeah. Hey guys, I'm Patty. Um, thank you all for being here very much. Um, and um, let's see, you know, I, first of all, uh, I want to throw that out there just for all of us attendees. I'm so grateful to be here that um, if, I'm not sure if you, you all know, but there was um, an, uh, an Israeli, I believe, Air Force strike of a massive um, five story theater complex mm -hmm. in uh, Jerusalem. Gaza. Gaza, Gaza. excuse yeah. me, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And um, I don't know, I just want to float it out there and, and, and find a way that, you know, I don't know, perhaps just maybe to respond in, in, in our various groups or as CAFA as a whole to, to uh, cause there's a massive outcry from the, the National Theater in the UK and Carol Churchill, many others have spoken to that, um, that, that thing, that bombing that happened on Thursday. So one thing I wanna throw it out there, but a general question, um, I'm, so, um, you know, I'm more and more being sort of identifying myself as an Ilocano, an Ilocano, person of Ilocano descent who lives in the United States and was raised in the United States. Um, there's many people in the Philippines. Um, and um, I know that I'm very conscious of the fact that the travel ban initially included the Philippines. Mm -hmm. I'm very conscious of that. And I'm very suspicious of when it may return or whoever might, might be added. And so I, um, you know, the, the work that I'm, I'm focusing on, for 20 years I really focused on the, uh, the United States war in the Philippines and I was ranting on that. But now I'm in a place where I want to be more vulnerable and I think about acquittal and how the beautiful, exquisite vulnerability they showed and in all the pieces, but I, I want to move towards more vulnerable places so it's making me feel extremely vulnerable. And I'm wondering in this time of Trump or in this time of uh, contemporary history the past you know, de couple of decades going backwards and going forwards, how do each of you take care of yourself? I, I feel genuine terror in researching, you know, like I, I'm kind of paranoid doing this, but I also, you know, like thinking, man, you know, I actually canceled the trip I was going to take to the Philippines, uh, to the southern part of the Philippines, where there's currently, you know, uh, where it's been a long standing Muslim community, long standing, I mean, hundreds, centuries long Muslim community in the southern part of the Philippines. And I canceled the trip because, um, you know, there's, there's massive shootings of random people pulled out of their houses going on now. And I'm, and I'm just wondering about, you know, how do each of you take care of yourself, uh, whether it's with coalition building or if you, if you approach um, a topic or a personal personal part of your work or like something you're researching, how do you care for yourself, whether it's like I said, coalition, coalition building, I don't mean like you know, tell the doctors not to tell the docs, but like how do you, how do you, uh, how do you care for yourself intellectually, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, socially, as you, as you continue to do this long, con as you continue to belong to the continuum of revolutionary work. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do we do that? How do, how do you do that? So <laughs> it, it feels like we might want to answer that question before we take a few more questions. Is that cool? Does anybody have something they want to say about that? How do we, because I think that's relevant to everyone is thinking of how do we care for ourselves during these types of things? Yeah, I'm, I've always heard the stories of people being randomly selected at airports and I say, mm -hmm. you know, I've been lucky I've never had that happen <laughs> oh to me. me. Yeah. Yeah. That, but now, now just in the last three months, I was given this SSSS on my pass, yeah. on my boarding pass yesterday. In, in Frankfurt, I went for this uh, randomly selected thing and, and three months ago in the Dominican Republic, I just smiled through it and I, you know, so what? Because people are actually suffering a lot more than that. So yeah, yeah. If, if that's the best they can throw at us, let's just run through it and, and do what we have to do. <laughs> Any responses to that? I, I think um, when we check in with whatever impact we're having, becomes really an integral part of, I know, our own self-care. 
because you can forget that very easily and you get so caught up in the work and we get so overwhelmed uh, that we oftentimes believe we're not having impact or we're not mm -hmm. affecting these conversations and, and, and our communities. And when we give ourselves permission, if you will, to, to sort of check in with that, to, to recognize, uh, it, it ha it's, it's empowering and it's, it's, it's healing. Um, and maybe it's odd that we, we do lose sight of that so often, but uh, um, you know, I, I think producing theater can sometimes be uh, very lonely and very isolating, mm -hmm. and, and all the work that goes into, I, in, in, in spite of the very collaborative nature of theater, and all the work that just goes into sustaining uh, an organization. Mm -hmm. um, so those kinds of, of doubts can very easily um, set in and have a corrosive effect on. Yeah, I'll say that um, I think that I think there's an element to PTSD that is part of being who we are, mm -hmm. and maybe that maybe even if we might say that's a too strong a word, it's mm -hmm. it's not when I consider the violence you're talking about and the violence that's in everything I've ever worked on or researched, but at least if it's not that, it's burnout. Mm -hmm. You know, so either way, you know, and I think that one thing that's been coming up in the multiple inner community discussions we've been having is how there are many different pockets of people doing work, and yes, they know each other, <laughs> for, the mo for the most part, not always. I mean, you know, people were surprised to say, oh, I know this artist in Philly who's got her own mix fest going on while we're doing the Atlantic mix fest. You know, it's like, it's like okay, like we really do need to know each other. But, but the thing is, we might all be starting from zero and building up in each, in each place. So I, I do think that there, there can be a way that we coalition build and communicate or something that builds on more than, so we're not all starting from scratch each time. But I, the thing that's been on my mind, um, especially when it comes to conferences or festivals and these things, is I always want a retreat portion. It's never happened, but it's always what I want. Like, people always say, come, lead a workshop, come, speak, come, do your play, come. I'm like, it's all great, it's great, it's great. I'm like, can we do a pre-conference where we're all like <laughs> getting our bubble bath? <laughs> 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 to any Middle Eastern festival that anyone can choose to do. We all gather the day before. Everybody's got their skills. Somebody's really good at yoga. Somebody's really good at movement. Somebody's great at voice. Somebody's great at writing exercises. Somebody's a perfect meditator. Whatever it is. Somebody's a good cook. And you just pre-conference together artistically. I'm like, that's that's all I ever want. And it's never, it's never part of the package. <laughs> so I think I think it's quite easy to, it doesn't what I mean is it doesn't need extra money. It's space. And by the time you have space an extra day, I think it's always nobody's paying people to do it. Everybody's bringing their own thing to the table because everybody wants it. We have, we have to wrap soon, but I know there were two people on the docket and then I saw a new uh, oh, maybe that you were on the, okay, so let's hear these two real quickly and then we'll, we'll uh, let Carolyn's wrap us up. Hi, I'll try, try and keep this short. Um, Aya, she, her, hers. Um, I kind of want to question and push back against Andrea's as, um, idea that um, things in music and the literary tradition are clear. Again, musicologist speaking, so I'm gonna <laughs> push back. Um, but I mean, the idea that there aren't racialized bodies in music or, um, it, it, if, if I heard you incorrectly, please correct me. Um, but I mean, like we, we wrestle with uh, Said all the time in Orientalist music studies and um, bodies are often implied um, through sound and so, and especially racialized bodies. And so two cents, feel free to like, whatever. Thank you for that. Yeah. I've, Thank you. And I want to lift up the normalization of identities and whiteness and stuff like that that you were talking about and how it's informed by all the 
different oppressions and da da da, historical forces and everything. And um, so my partner and I and a, a couple friends of mine were talking about genres and how, you know, this ki uh, kind of idea of a universal character or person who gets to be universal, you know? Um, and, and we were talking about who's the kind of character that you see. And, it's, and so my problem with the predominantly white institutions, not just whiteness. And um, so we started coming up with all these different identity categories and then putting the first letter of each of them on like sticky notes and then trying to make like what would that genre be. Um, and so we came up with a, a number of them um, and we came up with, we came up with um, white, hearing, able-bodied, rich, male, metro, from a metropolitan center, slender slash muscled, from the United States, Protestant culture, English language, cisgendered in your 20s and 30s, 30s, 40s. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we put the letters together and it formed warm suspect. <laughs> percentage of the entire global population. Mm, right, right, and yeah. so we're actually representing like outside of that particular <laughs> genre. So mm. you know. you I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We are at time, but I just want to give the panelists like a final, very short word reflection <laughs> close out. Um, Owen, would you start us off and we'll just hold this mic. Well, I, I think we have our homework Lots of ideas have come out here, and we should be working on implementing those. Uh, I, I want to just build on something that, that Danny had said, because he made reference to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, we've never healed uh, you know, that from that Ottoman history, and it, it creeps up all the time. Uh, so I, I, I want to also you know, recommend that we grapple with that. Mm. Um, as a theater maker with men of background. Uh, I want to say that I really appreciate this conference and making space for us and uh, the invitation to participate. Um, just going back to the question you asked about self-care, uh, I would say that it's the last two years have been very difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. And particularly as an Iranian living in the US and the US-Iran relations going to hell and, and watching the effects of it on my family in Iran, it's been extremely difficult. And you know, I'm an artistic director of a company. There are people that I, that I care for, that I protect. And then there is like me kind of sometimes feeling really alone and vulnerable and, and unprotected. So, uh, connecting with my colleagues and connecting with other artists, having our monthly phone conversations, me and Jamil, you know, those conversations and gatherings like this where they rejuvenate me and they make me feel hopeful and um, slightly empowered. Not empowered enough, I would say, but slightly empowered. Oh yeah, and just kind of um, stemming off that, I, likewise, I guess I probably most people in this space have felt kind of PTSD for the past couple of years, and I feel like every day is a new state of shock in some way. Um, I think all the more because there was such a moment of, we, yes, hope. we have turned the page, yes. and it won't be turned back again, and then it was, and we have a lot of bridges as well. Um, so I think you know, the answer for care and moving forward is really just to keep writing, performing, and hoping that we have things to do. No. <laughs> <laughs> pushing our boundaries and working together and just creating together. Back to that pre-retreat idea, <laughs> pre-conference ideas. <laughs> just getting in rooms where we can create together mm -hmm. is exciting. We're going to learn so much from each other and all the other people and all those other communities that are 80% of the world's population. That's, I mean, this is, this, that's, do we even need a revolution? We're a majority. <laughs> <laughs> Self-care piece, 
seriously because to a certain extent surviving and thriving is also a revolutionary effort. <laughs> and um, and we, we have to find the ways to, um, to make sure that we're healthy and, uh, and able, we can't hold space for others if we can't hold ourselves, right? And so we've got to make sure we um, slow down sometimes to do that self-care work for ourselves and all of us. And I'm going to put my kata hat on for a second and say that I think kata, it's been a conversation throughout the morning in the activism session. And I think we're developing the, um, the, the, the like organizational muscle to be responsive. And I thank you for mentioning the theater in Gaza. And I, I want to say uh, I'm interested as a board member in like figuring out how um, kata w might want to speak out as a, mm. as a network, as a body. Um, and on that and the, and the travel ban and other things that are really impacting our communities and the work that we do. And just say um, thank you all for being here and being present, listening, and being in, 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 in this movement with us and together. So, and thanks to our 